want to search for NADP, this is a sound check. If you're unable to hear this at the time, please let us know before we get started. We'll be getting started here momentarily. Thank you. Chris told me if I want to go. And very good afternoon on behalf of everyone associated with the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, NADP. Glad you could join us for this afternoon's webinar. In case you didn't get to join us this morning, uh, this title of this afternoon's webinar is Electronic Rain Gauges. Uh, this is the second in a series of webinars that we'll do that will talk about instructions and protocol related to what we ask for in sampling for the NADP NTN project. Uh, like I said, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's just going to be a step-by-step, -step, real impromptu type of uh, webinar. If at any point you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, type in your question. Uh, we'll go in between sessions. Uh, there'll be a itinerary that will follow, real and discreetly. And uh, and like I said, at any point, if you want to jump in and ask a question, we welcome your questions. I'd like to thank my mediator, Brian Kirshner, who uh, did a lot of work in putting this together. Uh, if you have not seen uh, the first webinar, it was entitled Sample Collection. It can be seen at go.illinois.edu forward slash NADP training. And this webinar as well will be available uh, once it is actually completed. And uh, then we'll get it uh, Put up on our website and you can view that as well in case there's anything that, that you thought you missed. Also what I'd ask in uh, this, if during the webinar you, you view it and you have questions after something that we didn't uh, cover during the webinar, uh, feel free to give me a call at 1-800-952-7353 or you can email me. The email address is at the top of every one of the Field Observer Report Forms, and in case, before I go much further, let me tell you that my name is Jeffrey Pribble. I work in Site Support or NADP NTN. Uh, electronic rain gauges. Uh, we've moved uh, past a little bit. We still have a few of the old style Belfort rain gauges in the network, but we're trying to modernize. And uh, we've moved to two different types of rain gauges. One uh, the ETI NOAA 4 rain gauge. And the other one is the Ot Pluvio 2 rain gauge. Uh, the ETI NOAA rain gauge is a more slimmer, sleek type of the holding capacity as far as the volume of precipitation that it will hold is a little bit smaller. The wiring is not quite as complicated. Still works off of a Campbell data logger. On the other hand, the Ot Pluvio 2 gauge that you can see to the right on your screen uh, works with an RMM. It's a, a little bit wider. The volume content of that is a lot greater. Uh, its nickname is Fat Boy, and I take no reference into uh, the performer uh, or the presenter of this webinar, so let's uh, keep that to a minimum if we could. But that is a, a little bit more detailed type of wiring uh, mechanism. Uh, as we progress, we will show you the uh, similarities of some of the wiring. We don't ask that you do any of that. Uh, we ask that maybe, you know, at some point you familiarize yourself with both rain gauges as far as the wiring schematics and stuff like that in case problems occur and uh, we call and talk to you and ask you uh, if things have occurred at the site, whether it be power outages, uh, water, you know, excessive rain and stuff like that. So uh, the more you can familiarize yourself with the gauges, the better off. Uh, before you ever think about downloading any data from a rain gauge or even approaching your rain gauge, uh, one thing that we ask you to do is always to make sure that you collect your sample bucket. Uh, the validity of the sample is the most important thing. What we ask you to do is go out and by protocol standards, 
open your collector, observe the contents of the collector, cap the sample, get the new bucket in place, make sure that you uh, record your off time. It's very important to know that the off time uh, for your bucket is the next on time for the next bucket in line. We'll talk that as we talk about a little bit more of the data and how to view the data. Uh, but once you got the sample in place, then it's real important that you uh, can get the new bucket in place. Then you can move on and download your data on your rain gauge. I'm going to ask the cameraman, Brian Kirshner, to bring back, and I want to show you a couple of the different options. We will talk about the flash drive, the SC115 flash drive. He will bring up a set of instructions real quick. I asked him to come back to me, but... Let's momentarily move to a two-page set of instructions that you folks can read through uh, at your convenience. The way the flash drive works is really, really, really user-friendly. Uh, for the ETI NOAA 4 gauge, uh, and I'll ask Brian to come back to me now real quick, is the connection, give it a moment to come back, the connection you see will sit on the outside of the rain gauge itself, and it's in a little, well, we, we like to think watertight type of a box where the connector sits inside. You can see where the wire comes out of it. The wire, this connection on this end will actually go into the data logger on the rain gauge itself, the ETI rain gauge. So you plug this one in right next to where the dongle is at, and you can download your data. Basically, when you go to the site, what you're going to want to do is just open this up, make sure that obviously uh, if it's sitting wherever it may be and is exposed to any of the uh, nature, you know, the weather, that you don't have any water and you make sure that that's clear before you open it up. Okay, we pull this out. The flash drive is, like I said, very user-friendly and very convenient. Basically, all you're going to do is plug your connection into your flash drive. Once you get that plugged in, make sure that you do not detach the connection from the flash drive until the red light has stopped blinking. That lets you know that your data has been downloaded. A failure to not let it finish processing can cause damage to the Campbell data logger. What's real important is the only difference between the SC115 flash drive and the PDA is your ability to see your data right away. For uh, data download purposes, if you want to take a laptop or whatever to the site, you can take your Campbell data logger once that you download your data, data and plug it right into the side of your laptop and then treat it like you would a thumb drive, click and drag, attach it to an email and send it off to us. Uh, within moments, that data should be processed, and you will be able to look at your data on our website, and we'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. But your instructions, as we go back to the instructions, I ask Brian to go back momentarily. You'll see on the instructions that for sending the data, you send the data from the flash drive as well as on your PDA to NADP. Okay, let me flip the page there. <laughs> NADP slash precip at isws.illinois.edu. That's NADP slash precip NADP dash precip at isws.illinois dot edu. I knew I'd get that right sooner or later. And then send that data off to us. And like I said, in, within a matter of moments, it should be processed and available for your viewing. And all the instructions for doing that uh, are on that SC115 uh, memo that you're currently looking at. If there's any problems with the downloading of the data or questions in sending that, don't hesitate to give me a call at the 800 number. I'd like to bring back the camera to me momentarily. You're not going to have to look at me much longer, so bear with us. The second version for downloading data, and this one is the one that goes with the Pluvio 2 gauge. This is actually attached to the RMM. 
If we can go back to the picture of the pluvial gauge initially for a moment, and I know I'm switching back and forth a lot, but I want you to see specifically what I'm talking about. See on the right-hand side where it shows the uh, R, what we call the RMM, this black, the black, okay, now come back to me, Brian. The black cord will be in and attached to the data logger at all times. When you go out to the site to download your data, basically all you have to do is open the door on the RMM, treat it just like you would with the ETI. This will be connected at all times, and then attach your flash drive just like this, and let the data download. Once the light goes out, the data is downloaded. You can treat it just like you do with the uh, ETI gauge. And that's the two versions. And basically, the nice part about this is the fact is that you can just kind of tuck this back up into the RMM and shut the door. You don't need to worry about the weather-resistant box or anything like that. Any questions regarding the SC-115 flash drive? Okay. Let's move on to the PDA. I'd like to show you, as we get to the PDA, uh, we're going to show you a couple of the wiring diagrams. These are just... Uh, things that you can look at if there's any questions regarding uh, the wiring of the, the gauge itself. Uh, don't hesitate once again to give me a call. This is a, uh, what it looks like for the AeroCam to the NOAA 4. More than one collector can be attached to a a rain gauge. Uh, a lot of the sites that we incorporate here in the NADP network uh, are the NTN collectors, which is the uh, weekly precipitation, and the Indian, which is a mercury deposition network. So a lot of them are wired in together through a rain gauge, and this is just a copy of what this looks like. Uh, familiarize yourself with your, you know, we don't ask that you do any wiring. But if problems do occur, this is one of the things that's Kind of nice to look at, so go to the next one, please. This is a copy of the INCON event recorder that goes to the NOAA 4. INCON is another kind of a collector that we have. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. It's a one-bucket type of collector in comparison with the AeroCam, which is a two-bucket. And the third memo that you'll see on your screen is the end kind of event recorder wiring to drop through the RMM. This is a little bit more of a detailed wiring diagram, but it basically the schematics are about the same as a positive and negative wiring, on off switch. Uh, you know, you can wire more than one collector into the into the system if you wish. Now let's move to the PDA. Before I move on to the PDA, are there any questions related to the flash drive? I know in this morning's session I was not quite thorough enough, and uh, I apologize for that. So if there are any questions, I'll take a moment and we'll kind of wait for those questions to come through. I know that it doesn't automatically uh, load into our computer, so take a break for just a second. This is a PDA. Uh, sites that do not have the flash drive are given a PDA for being able to download their data. Very, I think, very user friendly as well. It's kind of neat to play with on occasions. Uh, there's a number of things that you can use the PDA for as far as downloading your data, see how your uh, rain gauge is actually reacting. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to look at the cycles, the wet, dry, and this exposure as long as you as well as your voltage. One thing to really make sure that I didn't stress so much in the morning session was making sure that when you look at the main screen 
on your PDA that you have the correct time. If you do not have the correct time, that can cause a problem. If there's a difference between the time on your PDA and the time on the data logger, then the download can be uh, problematic. So make sure that that's one of the things that you look at. Also on the PDA, make sure that when the PDA is not in use, that you have it plugged in and it's charging. If you can go out to the site with about 100% battery capacity, uh, it makes for an easier download. So what I want to do is a step-by-step -step function on how we're going to go about downloading the data. Are there any questions before we advance? I'm trying to get this as straight as possible on the screen so they can look at it. That's pretty straight. So the first thing we want to do is establish a connection with our Bluetooth. Basically, in the lower left-hand corner, follow my hand as the stylus, and if there's any problems, let me know. Basically, what you're going to have when you receive the PDA from us is a shortcut, and the program will be installed into your PDA, and the shortcut will be programmed to where when you go to the site and you get next to the rain gauge itself, all you have to do is double-click on your shortcut. It's connecting. Once it is connected, what you're going to do is you're going to see two green arrows kind of facing each other. And if you can see that on the PDA itself, after you've established, that lets you know that the, that the connection to the Bluetooth has been established. Once we determine that, then you go to the upper right-hand corner and hit on the X, and you get out to the main screen once again. Then what we want to do is go to the lower right-hand corner and click on NADP Ring. It'll take a moment to load. And the next screen you're going to see will give you the options of retrieving data from the rain gauge. That's the one you're really concerned with. Or if for some reason you want to refer back to data uh, that you may have collected three or four weeks ago, you can either do that on the website or you can look at it through the PDA, either way, uh, going to the website and familiarizing yourself with the website, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, gives you a good option as to being able to see the data. So what I want to do is I want to retrieve my data. I'm going to click on Retrieve Data. It's going to give me an option to connect. Okay, we've connected to the Bluetooth already. That's what the green arrows were on our shortcut. What we want to do now is we want to connect to the data logger itself. That's where our precipitation is recorded. So we're going to hit connect. There again, sometimes, you know, there's momentary lapses where it'll take a second. Okay, we are connected. Down below, it'll give you a side ID. I don't have a particular side ID. I have this uh, gauge that's next to us set up in my office that way for phone calls. Uh, I have the luxury of being able to take my own PDA and talk to operators and work them through any problems. Uh, when you call in as an operator, uh, it's a learning experience for me as well. Things that happen in Florida may not necessarily happen in Washington State. Things that happen in California may not happen in Maine. It's a learning experience, so anytime you have an opportunity to share something that has occurred to you during your visit to the site, if you don't record it in the remarks section on your field form, please give us a call and let us know what may have occurred that may uh, you know, cause a problem with the sample or the download. Uh, all the data that comes in is reviewed. So if we see stuff like this and you don't let us know about it, then it's something that we have to uh, give you a call about or email you about in regards to whether it be precip types, uh, whether it be uh, longevity of mist exposure or dry exposure. So the more you can let us know, you are our eyes in the field. So now that I've got to this certain point, I want to download my data. I hit the button that says download, and I'm going to go to the download from. It would be really, really nice with all these PDAs if you want you to hit that download button if it would uh, remember the date that you last downloaded from. But my PDA, like a lot of others that I get phone calls from, likes to just pick a date out of a hat. Well, this morning, I was lucky enough to get the end of the February, 
and early afternoon we are on the 30th day of January. So be, be uh, aware of that when you go to download uh, that you check your date. Okay, we're going to go back and it is the 27th of March. So I'm able to advance that. You saw how I did it. I got to the March. I'm going to click on the 26th. That was yesterday. That was the last time I downloaded. And I'm going to click on 9 a.m. because that's when I did it. Take your time and just, as you proceed through your download, make sure that everything is correct. Uh, if you happen to download from a certain point and that's not something you want to do, you can back up, exit out of that particular part. You're still going to be connected to the gauge. And just go and change the time and re-download. I'm going to hit download. I want to download from yesterday. The way this works is you're going to see something called records. Every 15 minutes on the eGage, whether it be the CBO2 or the ETI, is going to be considered a record. Uh, if you go from Tuesday 9 a.m. to the following Tuesday at 9 a.m., 688 records. So every 15 minutes is considered a record. Now I'm seeing that I I downloaded from yesterday. I have 124 records. What I want to do then is look at the amount, the data. I'm going to go to the lower right hand corner. I'm going to click on data. It went a little bit too far for me this time, so I'm going to back up. I want to disconnect. I had a problem. Don't panic. I'm going to exit. I'm going to go back in to retrieve data once again. I'm going to connect again. And this is a little bit fast. Okay, I've lost total connection here. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to exit out of my PDA and I'm going to have to reboot. One of the problems that we talked about in uh, during the data download is you can run into problems and it's not a panic state. I'm not going to panic here. I'm going to know that I've lost my Bluetooth connection. On the newer PDAs, about halfway down on the right hand side, if you can see the stylus, as I point to it, there's a black button. I'm going to have to reboot my PDA. So I'm going to press in. Your screen will go blank momentarily and then it'll come back with a Make sure it looks like this. It's going to run through a complete reboot system, and then you'll be have to start at the very beginning once again. Like I said, this is not a panic situation. A couple of the messages messages that you will see in working with the NOAA 4 is uh, a message called COM port does not exist. A lot of times what will happen is if you have a power glitch or something along those lines where the data logger will go off momentarily, then you, what you're going to have to do is either reset your PDA or you're going to have to go into the gauge itself and reset what we call the dongle. And momentarily, I'm going to show how you get into that. So I've rebooted the system. And what I'm going to have to do now is I'm going to have to go into the Bluetooth. And I'm going to minimize this because I don't want to drag this out too long. But I'm going to have to go back in. I'm going to have to establish connections. See where I do not any longer have the ETI, so I'm going to go in and I'm connected to my gauge once again. Get out of it, put it in ADP rain, and then proceed. Momentarily, I'm going to show you instead of on the PDA and going all the way back in, I'm going to connect and I'm going to go through this quickly so we can get back to the screen I was before I lost my connection. If you have a tendency, make sure that when you are connected to the rain gauge that you don't stray too far away. It's okay to set the gauge or the PDA down next to the gauge and just let it do its thing. We're going to download. We downloaded from yesterday. Once again, it changed times on me. Back to nine, let's say nine o'clock. 9 a.m. will download once again. It's in the process. When you see the little wheel turning in the middle of the PDA, that lets you know that the data is downloading. The records, once again, I'm going to go and I'm going to hit data. 
you know, it's going to ask me if I want to look at the data from 12.15 a.m. Well, I don't want, that's the middle of the night, so I'm going to say 9 a.m. Till today at, you know, we download it. So I'm going to say 3.15 p.m. Now at the bottom, what's a lot of the PDAs will not have, it'll ask you for network. Uh, we actually run at our Bonville site, which is the home site for uh, us, Illinois 11. Uh, we run three collectors off of one uh, ring gauge. So we run the NTN, the Mercury, and what is called the Airmon, which is a daily uh, sampling network. So I'm going to view, now that I've got all my times correct, I'm going to view my data. And ask me for a warning, selected. That's okay, just hit OK. And the next thing that comes up on this screen is the date, the precipitation, the wet exposure, dry exposure, and as I scroll over, I want you to be very aware of that column called cycles. Every time the collector opens and closes, that's considered a cycle. Uh, what we want you as operators to do, once you download your data, these four columns are what we want you to familiarize yourself more than anything else. Uh, we want the wet exposure, dry exposure concerns us. There's got to be a reason for dry exposure. Mist exposure uh, with the AeroChem collectors that we have and the grid sensors, obviously they're not as sensitive as the new uh, collectors that we have that use an optical sensor. So the cycles will be a lot more and I'll uh, expand on that momentarily. Okay, we've downloaded our data and we're content and this is going to be the information that we transcribe onto our field form. Make sure, it's very, very important before you shut this PDA off that you get all the way out to the main screen. All you have to do for that is in the upper right hand corner once you're on this screen, just hit OK. It's going to take you back to this particular screen. Find an open area with your stylus. And bring up the menu. It says connect, download data, time, language, collector, and exit. Click on exit. You want to disconnect. Basically, this is going to disconnect you from both the Bluetooth and the data logger. You're going to exit out of that. You're in the, the uh, NADP program once again. You're going to hit exit once again, and you're back out to your main screen. Then it's okay to shut the uh, PDA off. You want to attach it, like I said, to your charging and, uh, and let it charge. If, you're, if it's not in use, then leave it charging. Are there any questions? Let's take a break momentarily for, for questions. The next part we're going to cover is troubleshooting. If, one of the questions was, if you run into a random date, uh, like I said, I'd like to think that this uh, the PDA doesn't have a mind of its own. Uh, the question is, when you reset power to the rain gauge, okay, never mind. Um, I would have to get in back into it. Uh, this, the only problem that you're going to have is if you do not get out all the way and you go back to connect to, let's say that you left it on that screen that had the wet exposure, the question is what happens if you do not get out of your uh, data screen all the way? If you do not get out all the way to the main screen that you're currently looking at on your computers, what will happen is, is you're basically leaving the site with your PDA still connected to the Bluetooth. And what's going to happen is, is once you go back out there uh, the following Tuesday and you try to connect, it's going to be really confused because you really, in essence, never exited the uh, data logger or the Bluetooth. So you're going to have trouble connecting. So that's why it's so important that you get all the way out. You disconnect from not only the data logger with the exit, but you disconnect from the Bluetooth and get back to your main screen. So I hope that answered your question. Next thing I want to do is there's uh, troubleshooting to be done. Uh, if you get that uh, 
or just routine maintenance. Uh, what's really, really important, and I'm going to bring the screen to here to me momentarily, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that occur with this ETI gauge. It can also occur. Everybody see that okay? I'll give them a moment to, uh, to comment if they're not hearing the sounds well enough or if they're not seeing the picture well enough. Okay, there's apparently no comment. This is an ETI gauge. What happens is, if you were to get a, for example, a COM port does not exist, what happens when you get that type of a message is the fact is that there's been a power glitch or something along the lines that are going to force you to get into the gauge. When you receive this gauge, you should have received an Allen screw or an Allen wrench that will let you unscrew at the very bottom of these, and maybe I at some point can get my uh, moderator to zoom into this a little bit once I take the uh, outer shell off. But what you're going to want to do is make sure that you're very, very careful in loosening the screws. Before you loosen the screws, uh, what I ask you to do is remove the top of this. And you're going to be very, very careful because it is such a sensitive gauge. So I'm going to remove the top part of the ETI gauge. I'm going to set that aside. Now would be a good time for you to loosen your screws. What's happened is, is the bucket, the inside bucket, is actually sitting on the data logger itself. So you're going to be, want to be very, very careful in grabbing the bucket itself, be wary of the uh, contents of the bucket as well. And you want to lift it straight out. It is fairly heavy. You get a good grasp on it, lift it straight out, being careful not to slosh any of the, of the contents of the gauge around because you got to remember at the bottom of this gauge is where your electronics start. So if any moisture were to get down in the bottom of that, could cause electronic problems. What you're going to see in the bottom once you remove this particular bucket are the plugs for the optical sensor. And I'm going to remove this shell now. You've got to make sure when you look down into the bucket, you'll see two plugs. One is marked red, one is marked yellow. Unplug those, be very, very careful, and I'll show you here momentarily. I'm going to, I have them unplugged. I'm going to remove the outer shell of this gauge. What you're going to want to do is lift it straight up off of the data logger. I'm not sure if we can get a good view of this, but let's try. If we can, see on the inside of this particular outer shell that you have these two wires. Those are the wires that actually get plugged into the data logger. You can see where my hand is. Both of those get plugged in. Those have to be plugged in in order to make the gauge to work properly. I hope everybody was able to see that. If, for some reason, a problem occurs, we have quite the wiring schematics here. So we double plugged into this, which we are. Hmm. Let me momentarily here. There's an inside battery on this rain gauge as well as I have it plugged into an external external battery as well, just for basically a backup. What I want to do is you want to make sure that the you know obviously the red goes on the positive and the black on the negative. If the problem does exist, that you get a message like COM port does not exist, and you call me and you say that, and I've asked you, did you reboot your PDA? You say, yes, I rebooted my PDA. Next question I ask you is, did you have any sort of a power outage? You say, yeah, I think that the, you know, the power might have been out two or three hours. The battery that's in the inside of this ETI gauge, and I'll turn it so you can see it. And I'll ask Brian if he can maybe zoom in on that. The two components off of the back of the gauge are the battery and the charger. And this charger is according to, you know, it being plugged in onto an AC if that is your, if 
that is your source. If your power does go out, the battery will probably hold a charge and keep the uh, gauge going for three days. After the three days, that's when you'll see the loss of data. So if, uh, if you do have, you know, like Superstorm Sandy, we, we run into some sites that uh, incur some significant power outages, that's where you incur the loss of data. I'm going to spin this around ever so slightly, and I'm going to ask Brian once again to see if he can't get a close-up view of the one thing that I'll ask you to look at when you record. Will be the dongle. Bear with me momentarily. We're going to do a little adjustment. Thank you to that fine gentleman that took apart my gauge. Gave me a little curveball, didn't I? I guess I can see that what I was doing. What you're going to want to look for on the gauge is when I ask if you reset the dongle, this will be the dongle. On the side of the dongle will be a flashing blue light. I'll ask you to reset it. What you're going to want to do is take and pull the plug that goes into the top of the dongle out and plug it back in. If that does not work, then also I'll turn this ever so slightly more so Brian can kind of zoom in on ever so slightly. This plug right here is a main power plug for the gauge. All you have to do, and it's a two-prong plug, unplug it and plug it back in. Then I would go about resetting the dongle once again so you have a flashing blue light. Just to make sure that you reset the entire system, then I would take my PDA and I would reboot my PDA. It's all the three variables that could occur problems can occur on the ETI. When you're putting back together the bucket, let's go to the to the uh, part where we're talking about the putting the bucket on properly. And this works as well for the NOAA 4 or for the Fluvio 2. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put the shell back on. What you'll see is a diagram of how, if you put back together the gauge wrong, uh, what can occur. Uh, bad precipitation a lot of times in the data that you send in can inc be incurred uh, by not putting the bucket back in properly. There should be the same circumference all the way around between the bucket sitting on the data logger itself and the shell of the gauge. If the bucket, as you see, is leaning to one side between the correct and incorrect, what that does is if you get any sort of wind or anything like that or what were to occur, then that causes bad precipitation, noise in the load cell. So basically, if I'm setting this back up here on this, you'll see on the bottom of the canister, if I can review, get Brian to come back to me here momentarily, on the bottom of this, there are three little holes. And on the top of the data logger itself, there are three little nodules. The nodules have to, or the indentations from the bottom of the bucket have to sit on the nodules of the platform of the data logger on the gauge. So what we want to do is make sure that we set it on there. You can hear it just kind of drop down. And what it is, is very, very steady. If I were not to get on those nodules, it would be very wobbly. What can happen is if you don't get it down all the way, you put your shell on, what will happen is the bucket itself will lean on the inner, inner part of the shell itself, and every time you get any sort of noise, then you're gonna, it's going to look like precipitation. Once you put this back together, one thing that's very, very important before you put the bucket in, though, is make sure that you put your shell back on and to make sure that you had your plug that we showed you earlier plugged back into the correct spots on the data logger itself. Okay, we've got the outer shell on. We're going to put the bucket on. 
and I'm not going to go to the extreme of putting it all the way back together. What's real important is, and I'll show you with the shell, if we can get close enough to the camera, what I want to show you on the inside is right here, this is a good picture, right here are the optical sensors. You can see where this, this wire is actually goes down, and that's plugged into the data logger. The indentations between the bucket, the grooves where you pick the bucket up out of the off of the platform, have to be lined up with the optical sensor on the inside shell. If they are not lined up correctly, then there's no way for the rain gauge to make a determination that precip occurred. It's basically blocking the optical sensor. That's what we cause, and we lose data that way. So make sure that once you put it back together, that the indentations and the holes for setting the bucket are lined up with the optical sensor. Any questions? Okay. Well, my apologies on the correction. I said it set on the uh, data logger. It actually sits on the load cell. That's what I meant to say. I apologize for anybody listening. And if I confuse anybody. Any questions? Winter. How's winter work? Uh, for the ETI gauge, depending upon where you're at, one of the primary concerns is putting antifreeze in. Uh, Ethylene glycol, something biodegradable, 60-40 uh, ratio. Uh, if you're in a really, really cold environment like a Colorado or a Wyoming where you get a lot of snow, the more that you can put in, the better. Uh, if you're in a, you know, a site, say, close to the Mason-Dixon line where you maybe get one or two snows a year and the temperatures drop down and get a little bit cold, you get some freezing rain or the, where you get rain and the temperatures drop, then it's not necessary to put as much antifreeze in, maybe one or two inches uh, into your bucket. Uh, it's real important that you keep the uh, mixture of antifreeze stirred up. And the antifreeze is heavier than water, and what's going to happen is it will stratify, where that means that the antifreeze will sink and the water will freeze on top of the antifreeze and any sort of precipitation that gets into the rain gauge uh, will blow out. So we ask that you uh, keep that stirred. Uh, don't worry about in stirring that up. Uh, if that shows up as precipitation, when you send in your data, uh, what you may notice on your field form uh, and what you download and transcribe on your field form uh, is one of those things where you say, okay, well, I put down 49 hundredths of an inch, and when I looked at it on the website, it said I only had 39 hundredths of an inch. How come? Well, what we do is once you send in the data, Roger Claybrook, who is the director of our uh, rain gauges and the NADP site liaison, uh, he goes through and looks at all the raw data. Any sort of false precipitation that you may have that occurs, he will remove that. And so what you see when you get onto the website is actually the true data itself, and it's broken down. Uh, and he reviews back as far as the 15-minute increments, uh, hourly and daily. So any questions on that? In dealing with the OpPluvio 2, uh, it being a bigger orifice, it's going to require more antifreeze. Uh, it undulates up to the top, and I'm not going to lift it because it's full of water, but you need to make sure that you add enough antifreeze to where it covers the entire bottom of the orifice itself. This handy dandy little item is called a transfer pump. And this is, might be one of the greatest inventions that I've seen in a long time. This is better than, actually, we were thinking of ideas uh, for operators to be able to uh, take out old antifreeze and to renew their antifreeze. Uh, we actually went online at one point. I thought I had a solution with a oversized turkey baster. It did not work. But uh, the fine folks in our QA department, Mark Road specifically, uh, found this uh, transfer pump, and basically it's two hoses. One goes down into the gauge, and what you're going to want to do is take a bucket that says discard. 
specifically this card. Do not use a bucket that you're going to take from your uh, stock of used or clean supplies because it can never be used again. All the supplies that we ask you to send back, uh, we wash and reuse and send to another site. So basically, you've got your one hose down the bottom. You're going to hold the other hose, and you're going to pump. We're going to get it here in a minute. Okay, what have we got going on? We have air and wine, apparently. Bear with me. And these are all sorts of problems that can occur out in the field. Persistence pays off. And now what we've got is we've got water coming out of the being drawn in through this hose and being dispersed into this hose into the bucket. Be very, very careful in taking it out. And get it all over yourself like I did this morning. That was part of the comedy of errors that occurred in this morning's seminar. But, you know, this kind of thing happens. After you've drawn out enough antifreeze, make sure 60-40 ratio. Once again, fill it up with enough. Uh, there again, uh, the volume of how much antifreeze you want to put into your e-gauge is based upon how cold and how much uh, frozen precipitation you get at your site. Any questions? In the harsh conditions, uh, the question is, is uh, the folks in Alaska, uh, the folks in Alaska <laughs> make comment that they're unable to keep their antifreeze from freezing. Uh, yeah, I wish I had a solution for you. Uh, it's colder than it should be, and uh, that's just one of them things that, you know, hopefully you're not having to do that on a weekly basis, but, you know, it's it's very important that you keep the antifreeze as, a, as stirred and from stratifying, so if it uh, has to be done weekly by weekly, so be it. Uh, my apologies, but it is the uh, nature of the beef living in Alaska. Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, how do I go about getting a transfer pump? Uh, every site at some point will have a transfer pump. We just ordered some more. Uh, they will be shipped in our six-in-one supply boxes when you get your uh, new supply of buckets, uh, lids, and bottles, along with your boxes for shipping the samples. Uh, make sure that even when you get those, if there's not a uh, supplies and clothes sticker, that you open those up uh, and to see if we've uh, attached any memos or any supplies that you've been requesting. So it's important that once those come in, that you open them up and look. But everybody eventually will have a transfer pump. Questions? I want to take a break and move to the field form part of this. This is a copy of the field form. Uh, basically, it's real important to know, and uh, the next webinar that we uh, will be having will be sometime in May. We are going to talk about uh, decanting a sample, uh, pouring the sample, visualizing it, and filling out one of these field forms completely. I just wanted to touch base, especially with Section 7 on there, which I believe is a precipitation record. Make sure that you transcribe all the information that you take off of your PDA or off your flash drive once you have sent us the data uh, before filling out your field form. It's very important, although we do look at that uh, when we initially get your sample in. This is part of what we send or um, enter into our database. Uh, preset types are very important. It's uh, important to know that you're our eyes in the field. Uh, you can speculate, the poor gentleman that uh, made comment from Alaska, that you know what you're probably getting snow in December where uh, you know the the gentleman down in the Virgin Islands where we have one of our sites we can probably if he doesn't write anything in preset type we do not make assumptions uh, if he doesn't write anything he gets the same uh, email that says please uh, make a, uh, make yourself aware that you did not circle the preset types I think we can eliminate snow 
but it's still it uh, keeps them conscientious, keeps operators conscientious as to what we expect on a weekly basis as far as our protocol. Real important, once again, I'm going to make one more point on the on-off time. Remember, when you take a bucket off, that is your next bucket time on. When you take that bucket off, say, at 9 o'clock, your next bucket on is 9 o'clock. Your next bucket is not on when you're done downloading the e-gauge. Uh, it's not when you're done filling out your field form and you send off the sample. A lot of times what will happen is we're getting operators that think that, okay, I changed the bucket, but I didn't download the data till say, 1 o'clock. So that leaves a four-hour gap. Or I get, or we get a, a tremendous. Uh, sometimes you got to remember that uh, the confusion is uh, okay. I'm going to change if I do the e-gauge first, and then I change the bucket later. Then I may have taken the bucket off at nine o'clock, but I put the next one on at 7:30 a.m., which is you know an overlap of time. So be very conscientious of what occurs. Block number four on the field form is something we want you to be aware of as well. That is how the uh, site operations work. Uh, you know, when you open the collector, uh, section one of block four, uh, ask how the motor box and sensor worked. Uh, did the collector open and close on its own? Uh, part two of that is, did the uh, rain gauge operate properly? Uh, by you being able to download your data and stuff like that, you know, that's the difference between a yes and no. Uh, section 4.3, did the collector open and close at least once? That's where we want you to become aware of the cycles. Uh, if you don't have these cycles, uh, you know, then we need to maybe talk about, you know, the the wiring and making sure that the uh, that the event recorder wires are hooked in properly to the gauge, so you can monitor uh, the openings and closings of your collector. And section 4.4 .4 is uh, is the gauge winterized. Do you have any freeze in there? Uh, if not, then you know that's how you go about that answering that that part of it. Any questions? That's the field form. Since there's no questions, I want to move on to how you look at your data. Bypass this. This is our website. Make yourself familiar with our website. It's nadp.fws.uiuc.edu. I'll pause for a moment. We have a question. Uh, basically, if your antifreeze has frozen up, do your best to get it out of the container. Out of the container, uh, make sure that you understand it's, you know, you have to use, uh, be aware of environmental laws. You don't want to just dump antifreeze on the ground and let it thaw out. Uh, so do the best you can at letting it thaw out. And, uh, refurbishing it, uh, remembering that 60-40 is your ratio of antifreeze to water. Uh, trace amounts on the field form. For an AeroChem collector, uh, we still uh, will, uh, if you're looking at a Belfort, Belfort rain gauge, the old style rain gauge, uh, a little increase in lines or an opening. Uh, there's two lines on the, the uh, Ring gauge chart itself. The top line is the event line. The bottom line is the precept line. If we have, say, three or four openings and we have a bottom, we look at the bottom pin and you can see a little bit of increase. And uh, the operator says, well, you know, it opened a couple of times. We had a couple sprinkles of rain. Uh, from an AeroChem standpoint in our data, that is a trace amount. Uh, for the ETI and the Outpluvio, uh, the inability to pick up that sort of precipitation, uh, that's given zero. And that's been something that's been discussed, uh, you know, and that'll continue to be discussed. The website you see is National Atmospheric Deposition Program. Make you aware of the National Trends Network, the Mercury Deposition. Uh, what I said earlier was the uh, Atmospheric Integrated Research Monitoring Network. That's our AIRMON. That is a daily sampling uh, that rains. They change the samples on a daily basis. Uh, the Atmospheric Mercury Network, and what is our newest network in 
called AMON. It's a passive ammonia. Uh, those are the five networks. Uh, in 100 words or less, I'm going to show you how to go about seeing your site. Uh, if you're on this page, go to the National Trends Network, click. And you'll see this page under NTN. Go to Data Access. It'll take you to a, a page that says NTN Data Retrieval Options. Interactive map comes up with the NADP sites. Click on your state. Uh, the state we have, or the site we have, is Illinois 11. So I'm going to click right in the center of Illinois. You see where it says Illinois 11. I'm going to click on Illinois 11, and there is my site. Uh, down the lower left-hand corner, familiarize yourself with so much that you can look at. You can look at pictures. You can look at data over the years. The site's been going since the inception in 1979. Uh, I can look at annual data summaries, annual data, seasonal data, monthly data, weekly data, and daily data if I want. And basically all you do, and I'll click on it real quick, is to uh, the data selection criteria, look at it. Uh, if there's ever any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call at the 800 number. We can walk you through this. The site that I like is the National Atmospheric Deposition Program uh, Precept page. This is nadp.sws.uiuc.edu forward slash site ops forward slash PPT, forward slash default, dot ASPX. And basically, it'll let you look at your data. Go up to where it says site ID. I'm Illinois 11. I'm going to scroll down to Illinois 11. I want to look at, uh, let's just say, I want to look at all the data that I've collected since the 5th of March up until yesterday. That's three weeks worth of data. I can look at it one or two ways. You can plot the data, and the graphical perspective of this is hard for me to really look at. But basically, this is the way it looks. It's going to give you a graph version of everything that you'll see in a numeric form. Uh, if you look on the under cumulative precipitation depth, you'll see it starts on Tuesday, 3-5 and goes all the way to Wednesday at 327. You can scroll down. You can look at the cumulative precipitation depth, the raw bucket depth, the temperature. And the temperature is the uh, outside temperature, how it varies from hour to hour or from day to day, correction, the activity of the optical sensor, how your sample is exposed for the NTN. And then in, with this one, it gives us uh, the sample exposure for all three of the collectors that we have attached to our ring gauge. What I like to go back and look at, and what's more user friendly for me, is uh, the part called view data. Basically, and I'll go back real quick. Make sure under sample start and sample end, one uh, part that I uh, failed to mention was it's uh, very pertinent to put in the correct time. So basically, for me to look at that would be a little bit undisciplined. I want to go back to 9 o'clock, and I want to click on AM. And I took it off at, say, this afternoon is 3, uh, 3, 15 p.m. I'll click on PM. I'm going to change it to the 27th since we did it today, and I'm going to view my data. Number of columns here, and there's only a, a great amount of columns here because of the fact is that we run three collectors off of this one rain gauge. What I'm really concerned for you folks to see are the column one, which is the NTN collector. Uh, what I want you to be specifically aware of, it says collector one cycles, wet exposure, dry exposure, and mist exposure. When you download your data onto that PDA, before you exit out of your PDA, I want you aware of looking at that to see the number of cycles, your wet exposure, your dry exposure, and your mist exposure. That lets you be able to know if your collector, your rain gauge, is functioning properly. So when you fill out section four of your field form, then you're going to be able to answer without having to refer to this. 
once you send in your data and you connect uh, your PDA to your computer through ActiveSync or through whichever program you use for sending data, make sure that once you send the data that you go back and you look at this. This will be data. This will be raw data that you send us once Roger Claybrook has an opportunity to go through and look at it. This will be the finished data. Uh, what you'll see sometimes, and we are starting to send out something called a sample receipt report form, uh, is basically if something is not filled out, everybody, whether the sample or there's mistakes on the sample or not, will get one with each sample. We're trying to make the operators very conscientious and very aware of what is going on uh, when they fill, thing, uh, fill out their uh, information on their field observer report form. Uh, when you go back and look at that, uh, you may see red circles or something like that. Don't be panicked by that. Don't be panicked by the, the fact that you did get one of these report forms. It's just a uh, way of keeping the uh, operator informed, as I said. Uh, the red circles and stuff like that are an internal thing. Uh, as we pass data along from the person that initially enters it to the people that review it, that's one of the things. If you say, okay, I've got 49 hundredths of an inch of precipitation, and the website only says I got 39 hundredths. Reminder, once again, I mentioned it earlier, that we go through and we look at the data. It's raw data when we get it. We go through, remove any false precip that may have occurred. And what you see on the website is the finished version. Any questions or comments? I've thrown a lot of information at you folks today. I want you to be, once again, aware that on the top of every field observer report form, there's a phone number called 1-800-952-7353. There's also a, a email address, NTN email address. Do not, under any circumstances, ever hesitate to give me a call or email me. Uh, if, uh, there's no such thing to me as a stupid question. The stupid questions are the ones that you don't ask. If there's problems at the sites, we want to know about it immediately. Because if we can alleviate uh, a problem, uh, the moment that you notice it, and we save samples, and uh, that's what we're all about is uh, the validity of samples. But we're uh, we're looking for the operators to also be very, very safe when they go to the sites. Any questions? I signed out kind of abruptly the first seminar this morning. So I'm going to just kind of be silent. If there are any questions, uh, go ahead and type them in, and I'll try to answer them for you. If uh, within about a five minute span, if it does not come through, uh, like I said, once again, give me a phone call or email me. Uh, I'd love to make your acquaintance, talk to you. My name is Jeffrey Pribble, and I work in site support. Uh, before I sign off, though, I'd like to thank all the folks that were uh, very instrumental in putting together the webinar. A, a reminder that we're going to do this bi monthly. We look forward towards your uh, questions, comments criticisms, constructive criticism, any suggestions that you may have. Uh, the next one will be in the middle of May. We're going to talk about sample processing, how we decant the sample, uh, get it ready to ship off the cow, fill out our paperwork, and stuff like that. There's a lot of people I need to thank. Uh, first and foremost is the new assistant data manager. His name is Brian Kirshner. He was recently appointed that position. Uh, he comes to us from the Maryland area. So there is one happy cowboy when it comes to being an NFL football fan, is his Ravens of Baltimore uh, Super Bowl chance this year. A tremendous young man. Uh, look forward to uh, getting an opportunity to work with him as uh, he takes over this position. Tom Burgerhouse, our data manager, uh, has been instrumental in putting together. Roger Claybrook, who's an NADP site liaison, uh, has helped me out immensely in understanding all the logistics of the gauges and things like that. Mark Rhodes is our QA manager, uh, mentored me in uh, understanding the concept of how things work and the correct protocol without making shortcuts. And to our Cal uh, director, his name's Chris Lehman. Hope you're feeling better. He's at home today, feeling a little bit under the weather. We'd like to thank him as well as well as the program director, David Gay. If there are no questions, there's a question. Uh, the question is, how often does a battery in the Pluvio 2 
need to be replaced. Uh, they normally got a shot two years, two to three years. If yours does go so bad, uh, it's kind of up to the responsibility of the site. But if you're unable to get one, let me know. Uh, we have a few on the shelf that I'd be more than glad to send you. The next webinar will be sometime in May. I'm going to try to work it around my annual fishing trip <laughs> to Bull Shoals, Arkansas. Uh, it will be sample processing. We want to talk about after you've taken the uh, bucket off and the sample content, uh, we're going to talk about weighing it, uh, visualizing any sort of contamination, how about uh, deciphering the uh, sort of contamination that's in the bucket, decanting it into the bottle, what to do with the excess, how to fill out a field form, and how to you know download the data, just put the data onto the field form, and send it off to Cal, what to do with your buckets, uh, youth buckets, and everything like that. And that will come sometime, I believe, in May. It will be sample processing will be the title of our next webinar. Like I said, once again, if you did not get an opportunity to see our first webinar, you can go to the website or to the email address go.illinois.edu forward slash NADP training. Uh, this one will be readily available, I believe, here in, uh, give it a week. I would say that that's probably enough time. You can, uh, if you know anybody that missed today and you want to refer them to them, uh, give them our website and they can view it as well. If you viewed it and you have more questions than we were able to answer in this short period of time, like I said, don't hesitate to give me a holler. Look forward to talking with you. I'll look over to my moderator. Any more questions? On behalf of NADP and all the folks associated with NADP, I'd like to thank you once again for taking time out of your day and thank you for all the continued support of being site operators. We couldn't do it without you. Jeff and look forward to seeing you again in an upcoming webinar.